What would you say if I told you that by 2030, half of the young people in big cities come from a migrant background? And that also by 2030, the world's temperature will be at its highest peak. And that we, our generation, have to build a future-proof world for the generations still to come. Welcome to What Would You Say, a Y20 talk show about the most urgent issues of young people today. For those who don't know what the Y20 is, we'll explain. The Y20 means the youth 20. The voice of the youth. This year, the Y20 brings over 60 young delegates from over 23 countries and organizations together to discuss the most pressing challenges and opportunities faced by young people today. Together, they write policy recommendations that are then submitted to G20 leaders for their consideration during the G20 summit. This way, the youth shines their light on world politics. Our topic of today is sustainable development. We will be discussing this topic with Y20 delegates and that with the sole purpose of inspiring you. Mark, could you please tell us who will be joining us for this talk? Our first delegate is Miriam from Slovakia, representing the European Union. She's currently a master's student in Paris and London, studying both international public management and European studies respectively. Her favorite movie, Mamma Mia. Representing Saudi Arabia, we have Hamad. Hamad is a neurology resident doctor. He has a secret passion, spoken word poetry. Our third delegate joining us today is Isabella from Brazil. She has a bachelor's degree in international relations and economics, a master's degree in environmental sciences, and is a PhD candidate. Her favorite dish to make? Brigadeiros. Wow. Welcome to you all. Wow, wow, wow. Our delegates. So, I mean, your CVs and bios are so long that I'm like blushing that I can meet you, all three of you. So nice to meet you. We're going to talk about sustainable development. Uh, for those who don't know what sustainable development is, just a definition by the UN. They say it's the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Okay, that's a definition, right? But to make sure that we get to that point, point of development, we need some goals. So the UN also made sustainable development goals. Miriam, for the few viewers who don't know what sustainable development goals are, could you please enlighten us a little bit? What, what are they, the SDGs? So personally, um, SDGs for me are bold, uh, yet doable commitments uh, to tackle the world's most pressing challenges of today and of tomorrow uh, without leaving no one behind. And they are unique because they affect us all, but at the same time, they give each of us the opportunity to uh, build more um, sustainable, uh, safer, um, prosperous planet for all humanity. Wow, first of all, well said, well said. Second of all, bold but doable. Well, let's have a look. Somehow, it happened to be that I have this wheel of SDGs, also called the wheel of SDGs. And I have to do my own sound effects. So, eh? And we have some on them. So here you see, for example, industry and innovation and infrastructure. They say we need reduced inequalities. They want no more poverty. They want gender equality. They say like life below water, life on... I mean, if I look at them, they feel like so abstract, to be very honest. I mean, how, how, how do, do you guys relate to the fact that they are so abstract? This is the question I posed on you before. And then Isabella, you had this idea for the viewer to do the newspaper tests. What, what, is, what, is, the, what is that? We came with a newspaper. This is one from Brazil. It's from Folha de São Paulo. And if you look into all the news, you can relate it with the SDGs. For example, here we have something about the Amazon forest. The Amazon forest is related to biodiversity. And biodiversity, we do have an SDG related to it. And if you look into the other part of the, the newspaper, you also have something with the pandemic that goes with the health issue. Of course. And you have with the schools, uh, like the students going back to class, they are all related to the SDGs. And okay. it's not just in Brazil. That's a great way. Uh, Hamad, did you also bring a newspaper to check the SDGs in Saudi? So I'm trying to reduce waste. So I got a, 
iPad. Ooh, kind of newspaper. fancy, fancy. As much as possible, this is basically showing in Arabic uh, the uh, uh, the uh, energy minister uh, being part of the um, uh, uh, conference to decrease waste and uh, effect of energy, oils, and other industries on the climate and on the earth in specific. And they want to do a future goal and strategy to reduce any negative harm from energy production. Wow, very also big news in Saudi, of course. And then, and then, Mayam, what is the news in Slovakia? Yeah, so I have the Slovak news called Prauda, which means the truth. And here, uh, the main heading is about whether GPs will be testing for coronavirus. So basically, the SDG number three, uh, good health and well-being. Here, you have the heading about the protest about the minimal wage, uh, which we can relate to SDG number eight, decent work and economic growth, and maybe also the SDG number 10, reduced inequalities. Wow. So actually, whenever you open a newspaper, you see all the SDGs there right in front of you. Then, okay, so now we understand what the SDGs are. I understand that they are everywhere. But then, here's the shocking news. The UN wants us all to reach those goals by 2030. Hamad, please help me before I get a heart attack as a doctor. How can we do that? You know, we are just people. We have our problems, you know, how can we save the world in 10 years? <laughs> well, we can do it because we are people and people inherently want to work together. They prosper by cooperation. And this, in a sense, is all about finding the synergistic effect between different countries, different leaders and decision makers and different youth. So us youth are, by my definition, the real engine behind the goals of creating the SDG goals. The more we invest ourselves in understanding what these key performance indicators are and how we want to prosper in making this happen, the more we are able to work together towards creating a synergistic effect and slowly going into a sustainable world. You're not only a doctor, you're also a good speaker. Damn it! <laughs> Damn it, successful young man. Okay, Miriam, at you, how, how can we young people help saving the world in 10 years? Actually, let me start with this question, Miriam. Do you believe we can? Do you believe in 10 years the world will be better or is it just a fairy tale? Of course, I believe that the world will, will be better and not just in 10 years, but actually tomorrow, because even though the goals uh, appear to be really massive worldwide transboundary challenges, each of us can do simple steps in our daily lives to adopt more sustainable practices, more sustainable behavior. And not only that, we can speak up when we see um, unsustainable practices in our own surroundings, in, in, our, in the supermarkets, in the work, amongst our friends. And we never know when we inspire others and when we can be the, cat, uh, the catalyst of change. I really like that. We never know when we inspire others. I always tell that to myself when I'm feeling down. You never know. Maybe you inspired someone just being there. Isabella and you. Do you believe that we will succeed? Are you as positive as the other two here? I do believe that we can achieve everything in chill, like this 10 years. And I think that we can do like our part as small as it is. So if you are using water, why not turn off the water, the tab, when you are showering? Just pay attention. Every activity that you have in your life, you can contribute to achieving the SDGs. Okay, so we can contribute in everything we do. Let's contribute at this moment then, you already are, but I want to step up the game, literally, because look at my wheel of SDGs. Doing my own sound effect still. So, what I pro thank you, Mark. What I propose now is the following. I will turn the wheel of SDGs because we have to give the viewers some inspiration, right? Some of the viewers will be like, oh wow, but they are so smart and beautiful. I'm just like Lucas, just an average person, you know? And are they actually changing the world somewhere? So, what we did it is and on every SDG we have a few examples of young people changing the world already step by step like you said so I'm gonna turn the wheel where it stops we're gonna show an example and then I want one of you to comment okay so I'm gonna spin it there it goes it goes where it stops no one knows and it stops Perfect, life on land, which is everything except for the things in the sea and not on land, but okay, it's a lot. <laughs> life on land. <laughs> We're gonna show you a clip called Plant for the Planet and then we'll come to you. I certainly could have never predicted um, that a few kids planting some trees in their school would ever turn into a global organization. 
Our goal at Plant for the Planet is to convince the world to plant one trillion trees. Felix, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jack. When I was nine years old, my fourth grade teacher asked me to give a presentation about the climate crisis. I told my classmates that we should plant one million trees in each country of the world. And many of my classmates loved the idea, even though I think none of us knew how much a million was or even how many countries existed in the world. But a few days later, we went outside and planted our first tree. A local journalist reported about us, so a few other schools started planting trees as well. After one year, we had planted 50,000 trees. After three years, one million. And maybe this is why the United Nations asked us children and youth to lead the Billion Tree Campaign. When I addressed the UN General Assembly, I think I was like 13 and I was incredibly nervous. For us children, 2100 is still in our lifetime. I just wished I was back home in school. But we children don't understand why there's so little action. So far, 15 billion trees have been planted. To plant these trees which would have been impossible without good GIS technology and GIS mapping. We need to decide which areas we should focus on first based on the growth rates of trees in that area and how much carbon they capture. To define these restoration priorities, we need very good GIS mapping. I once heard this wonderful quote that one mosquito cannot stop a rhino, but a thousand mosquitoes can make a rhino change its direction. Everyone can plant trees, and every tree has an immediate positive impact. Why did you like this example? Tell me. Yeah, it's, it's basically a great example of the SDG number 13, climate action, and the SDG number 15, uh, life and land. And what I really like about this project is that it started originally uh, locally at a small scale, then it inspired others, it snowballed, and now we have the Trillion Tree campaign, which might seem like really a huge number, right? But actually, every one of us can do its bit. Maybe you can tell that there are already many trees in your region, but this shouldn't be the way we think. Uh, there are many areas around the world where trees are crucially lacking and actually we are cutting them down at alarming rate. Actually, since the start of the human civilization, it is estimated that we've cut down about half the trees on the earth. So, and really I have to know that the trees are crucial carbon storage, yeah. which means that they take out uh, carbon dioxide out of the air and release oxygen and are also uh, essential ecosystems yeah. for protecting biodiversity. And one thing that really struck me, and here we can see a new this uh, interwoven character of all SDGs, is that the recently released uh, UN's Global uh, Biodiversity Outlook report highlights that uh, biodiversity is essential to prevent future pandemics. Yes. So actually, we can see that from planting the trees, from protecting the biodiversity, from uh, preserving the outbreak of future pandemics, everything is interwoven. I think very well explained again, Miriam. Good 10,000 points to you. Uh, there's no end score of the points, so you don't win a prize, but still 10,000 <laughs> points. Know that it's also for biodiversity. Know that it's all intertwined. Thank you so much. We're going to continue with our beautiful game, Hamat, because, of course, health, well-being is very important. SDG3, let's see. Let's see if we can get it on number three by you saying stop on time, right? Let's try. There we go. Let's go. I'm gonna try my luck and I say stop. Yes! Wow! <laughs> That was completely non, not manipulated at all. Thank you so much, uh, Hamad. It's on number three, health, well-being. This is when I really like this video. First watch it, then I come back to you. Afghan girls, robots. Known for competing in major robotics competitions, like the 2017 worldwide first global robotic Olympics in the United States, 
The Afghan Girls Robotics team in Herat, Afghanistan is busy designing something completely different. Much needed ventilators during the coronavirus pandemic. Hospitals and medical institutions across the globe are seeing severe shortages of ventilators. As the number of COVID-19 cases increase, we can't sit around waiting for other countries to come and help us. We should do something here so that the lack of ventilators is not felt in Afghanistan. Ventilators are not just needed in Afghanistan, but the entire world right now. We wanted to help the government and the health ministry, and that's why we started working on the device. The team's trainer, Rafur Yaqubi, says these ventilators are primarily made of scrap parts from cars and will be ready for clinical testing as soon as next month. The engineers are hoping that their skills in making ventilators could one day lead to saving people's lives. Hamad, they have nothing, scrap material, and still they build these respiratory machines. How is that for you? It feels amazing that they're youth, actually. People, they have corporations, they have machines, they have uh, skilled engineers, but these people are basically youth who are STEM educated, who are passionate about creating. And most importantly, they're, they're actually, Afghanistan is the most populated or the, the largest youth population in the world. Second to it will be Saudi Arabia. And it's not surprising because youth are taking action whenever there's a global challenge. Now with um, COVID-19 being the major health issue, I think we can redefine these uh, SDGs uh, or our approach to health and saying it's mostly about health access. And when we're talking about ventilators, it's about basically trying to have access to uh, equipment, health equipment, not actually taking the treatment. And this is another take about how we can achieve SDG goal for health is to increase health accessibility by making sure that everyone is able to either have the equipment or create the equipment in their own countries. Thank you so much. I think you make a valid, valid point. It's not only health, it's health, access, access to health, because there's so much in the world already, but so few people who can have it all. Thank you so much. For the viewers, we have three more examples to go. If you want to take a break and go to the toilet, you just press pause. For if not, please stay with us. If this was a game show, I would be a game show host. Okay, right, SDG 6, it's here. It's here. I'm going to turn it around, try to stop it on time. Yeah? One okay. million points can be gained. There we go. <laughs> yes! Wow! So, clean water and sanitation, I think that is maybe the beginning. Clean water and sanitation. Because if you can drink clean, drinking is the most important thing. Then you can do all the rest we've talked about. So, let's go to Young Water Solution. Young Water Solutions is an intergenerational organization that supports young people to lead the solution to water issues in their own communities. And we do that by providing training and financial support. The Young Water Fellowship Program uh, proposes a model of capacity building, mentorship and seed funding for young people from low and middle income countries that have ideas of water projects for, uh, to, solve, uh, to address water and sanitation issues, water scarcity, water pollution uh, problems in their own communities. Actually, I'm doing this exercise with real stakeholders, with real farmers. My project is basically to use biojar as a environmentally sustainable and economical alternative to activated carbon and to uh, train the women residents of the slum to operate decentralized water filtration units. So what's the point of contamination and how? We seek to provide communities access to safe water through construction and rehabilitation of boreholes. Every single training, every single ses session is very interesting and very insightful to me because I get new, new ideas. It's an opportunity of a lifetime. It's the, fantastic, the most fantastic engagement in my career as a humanitarian and... We are launching this program because we're convinced about the power of young people to lead change in their communities and we're here to support them. Isabella, tell me, what did you see? I see an amazing opportunity that takes together the SDG 6 and the SDG 17, that is the partnerships, to come up with solutions 
through collaborative work, through research and through applying projects around the world. And I like to work with SG6. I'm a little suspicious about it because it's my main field of research. And I see that water is in the center of all the SDGs. If you do something related to water and sanitation, you're going to have impacts in all the other SDGs. So you would say the most important ones start with clean water, green sanitation, and then you can affect actually the world. So for those who still like, I want to choose an SDGs because I'm seeing this program, I'm inspired, I want to do something, Isabella tells you, and she knows, right? <laughs> start with water and sanitation, right, Isabella? Yeah, water is life, so why not do something about it? That's also a good sentence for those who are sitting on the couch not doing anything, water is life, yeah? So, we go to Miriam. Miriam, I'm going to give you education SDG 4. Just say stop when you think you're close to 4. There we go. Okay. There we go. So, SDG 4 is education and the little clip that we're going to show is light to read. Hi, welcome to the Binamo. The Binamoe is a community within the Wasai district. There's a lot of people, most people here are farmers, and there are also a lot of kids going to school in the nearby community Abasimpo. Because of the lack of electricity in this town, it's very hard for the students to read and study once the sunshine falls. Meaning, students will just have to go to sleep or just have to use touch light to be able to complete their homeworks. This touch light is the same time being used by the parents to be able to complete their house chores. Through the Light My World International Light Read project, we want to provide each and every student living in this community with a portable solar lamp to be able to read and study at night. This portable solar lamp is very, very efficient, bright, safe, and less expensive for the parents to be able to use. It does not need to be recharged, by buying a lot of batteries, you just have to put it under the sun and it will recharge and it can stay about five to eight hours each evening for the kids to study and read at night. We hope that this solar lamp project will be able to help students to increase their performance levels, thereby having more time to read and study and prepare for the next day. We hope that this will go on a long way, helping everyone in the society and of course helping the parents to be able to provide better and efficient education for their kids and what. So, Miriam, solar light education and uh, the fact that people can read and work. Tell me, what did you like about this project? Yeah, basically, one sees that one cannot think of the world just in terms of what uh, he or she experiences. Uh, I wonder that those who are watching us right now have access to water, food, education, shelter, and of course the internet. Uh, but actually an estimated 1.2 billion people are currently living without access to electricity. And this um, energy poverty conditions many kids around the world who go to school, want to learn, actually want to do the homework. So, um, of course, but without light, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. So this is really a great project where uh, students um, without access to electricity in the western part of Ghana are given these uh, solar-powered LED lamps. If only there were more of such projects, really. Absolutely. It's also, again, about access, what Hamad said before, the fact that you give us incredible numbers, stunning negative numbers, so many people. Um, and we can, if we work together, actually share way more of our wealth so that everybody has at least access, which is also the beginning of progress. Okay, we go to the last example because of time, Hamad. We'll try, just say stop on number 11. Let's try, let's try. There we go, one, let's two, try. three, <laughs> yes. Wow, <laughs> you did it. One million points. Okay. Sustainable cities and communities. We have a very inspirational example uh, from the Netherlands. Um, it's about life and death. Let's look at it. What if we no longer work with dead materials, but with living organisms? Imagine breathable homes, living lights, and self-healing t-shirts. If we are part of nature, then how come we act so differently? How can we become one with nature again? What if I told you the very solution was below your feet this whole time? 
This is mycelium, world's biggest recycler. Look at them go, fascinating. Continuously transforming organic matter and pollutants into fresh plant food that allows new seedlings to thrive and flourish. A wonderful closed loop system. We have found a way to become part of this system again. We are Loop and we are here to restore our relationship with nature. By using the power of mycelium, we can bring back human nutrients into the cycle of life in the most natural way. We have designed and grown the first living coffin that lets you become one with nature again. Feeding the earth with your very own nutrients to form a valuable resource for new life to flourish. Are you waste or are you compost? From graveyard to forest, let's close the loop. So the idea is you put a coffin in the ground and it absolves, it disappears and it feeds actually nature again. It, it sounds also mean deaf life. I know deaf is a, is a let's say, touchy subject. Uh, Hamad, how did you look at this little clip from the Netherlands? I see it as a way of redefining how we're living our lives. Um, if you really look at how industrial civilization was happening, we really built our cities to accommodate our cars, accommodate our transportation, our buildings, our houses. But we never really thought about how can it accommodate us. And by nature, humans need nature. We need, we need this, this greenness in our lives. We need to make sure that we're moving accordingly to how we were always meant to be, not with concrete, but with the greenness of the world. What he's doing is a very smart idea that uh, slowly lets us feel nature back again. Uh, it's a very simple concept, but it's very uh, technical when it comes to how it's, how it's working. Um, I myself would love to have more green um, areas in my land or, or in my house. I can imagine. Actually, I'm going to show you uh, a house they made out of mycelium because mycelium is just oh, mushrooms so. and plants. On the left, you see a pavilion they made out of mycelium. On the bottom, you see a chair. So the idea is you have a chair. The moment you don't want your chair anymore, you pulverize it in your garden and actually it becomes fertilization for plants or all living beings. So they are actually making houses that can go back to nature already. How great is that? They're actually one with nature. <laughs> yeah, that to be actually one with nature. It's also better for your health. If you're living in a house that is made out of bio-based materials, the air quality is three times better than if you're in a standard office building. My dear delegates, we gave so much inspiration to the viewers, right? I do can imagine that you're looking now as a viewer. I see some of you looking with the idea of, okay, these are all amazing people. You know, you just found the amazing. You try? Yeah, exactly, Lucas. I'm, for one, I'm very impressed seeing all these young people working very hard around the world on the SDGs. But I can also imagine that the viewer at home is wondering, what can I do to be that catalyst of change, as Miriam said, or to be part of the solution, as Isabella put it. So, delegates, I would like to ask you, each, each of you, to give that $1 million tip to the viewer, that one big takeaway on how they can live a more sustainable sustainable life and how can they how they can contribute to the SDGs in their everyday practice. Uh, Miriam, maybe? let's start with you. Okay, so dear viewers, <laughs> adopt these very simple little sustainable steps in your everyday lives and don't be afraid to speak up, really, because you never know when you can be the catalyst of change and really do this on the everyday basis when you see something unsustainable going on in your surroundings just express your, your opinion and really don't be afraid. Nice, nice. Hamad? So I would really call your call to action because youth are doing impressive things. But I would really want to remind you that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are actually a marathon. And the most important part of the marathon is passing the baton. So don't always be excited of creating your own, but actually try to be involved in the youth circles that are around your country. Find out existing projects and be a part of it, build and continue to build on existing projects. Actually sustain what you want to do for the Sustainable Development Goals. That's a very nice one. Don't just start on your own, everyone, but be part of the circle that's already existing that you like. And Isabella, last but not least, your tip to the viewer. I would say that they should, don't be afraid. Don't feel afraid to start doing something. Don't feel afraid to do the change. Think about your daily life. Think about your city. How can you change to a better world? Start with the local and then go to the other scales. 
So small skill is already a skill. I think that's a good one. I really want to thank you. I send my love to you, delegates. We have to stop now. Mark, can we get some music sending off those people? Uh, we are waving here. So thank you so much, Hamad, Miriam, and Isabella. Goodbye. Thank you. If you enjoyed watching this episode and you want more, which you do want, we have six other episodes waiting for you. So make sure to check out the website, tune in and stay inspired because we need young minds to change the world. My name is Lucas. My name is Yusra. And we thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye.